Hello, am I, am I alive? Okay, well, thank you everyone. My name is Anastasia Palais. I'm the executive director of Miami Freedom Project, and I'm here with Miami's beloved treasure, P. <laughs> Scott Cunningham <laughs> of oh Miami. Who, not, this is what's happening. I'm getting sentimental because <laughs> we're going into what will be um, potentially your, uh, as far as we know, for your, your last for now. Mm -hmm. um, as That's a good way of putting it. Last yeah. for now, um, O Miami Poetry Festival um, as the executive director. So welcome, Scott. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. I'm so happy to be here, too. <laughs> um, you know, when, of course, we always, as soon as we started the show, we wanted to speak to O Miami because I think there's so many things that O Miami represents mm -hmm. that we take for granted. Um, and yet there isn't anything given in O Miami's mission and how it came about and what it's been able to do in the community and its ability to last and become a force and a presence in our community. So I would love to just talk to you about in a retrospective way of how we got here, um, given that we are at a point of maybe paths are separating, mm -hmm. but hopefully on some kind of con with some continuity. So I guess my first question for you is, Scott, what brought you to Miami? How did, where did you start from? So I was born and raised in Boca, you know, which, as you know, is 45 minutes in a world away. Um, and, you know, as a kid, like, I, I came to Miami for various reasons. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that I knew anything about Miami. I mean, I very much, like, parachuted in for certain things and then parachuted out. And then uh, I went to school in the Northeast, and then I lived in San Francisco, and, I, uh, you know, I lived a couple different places, and, and but ended up back here to go to grad school at FIU for creative writing. And so when I moved to Miami to go to grad school, I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm from South Florida. I know mm -hmm. I know the deal. You know, I know what this place is like. And I realized very quickly that Miami was very different from Boca. And uh, it was really, I think my assumption that I would know something made me know even less than like <laughs> someone who didn't have that assumption. Oh. And it, it took me a little while to get used to the city and get used to the rhythm of it. But once I did, I really, really fell in love with it and fell in love with it really hard. And um, yeah, and then that's that's what started me on this journey was just the fact that I love this place. What was, how are we different from Boca? Like what was that, what was it? Is there a singular moment where you just felt like that tension or that disconnect from what you, what uh, an assumption that you had about how Miami was similar? It, it's it, right from the beginning. I mean, I remember when, so FIU has two campuses, mm -hmm. and the writing program is at the North Campus. And so I remember the after I got in, I was I was uh, at my parents' place in Boca, and I drove down. I just wanted to look at the campus, and and so I drove and looked at the campus. And you know, the North Campus is very strange, especially back then. It didn't really look like a college campus at all. It looked just like a, an assortment of weird office buildings. <laughs> So that was jarring, and then and then I decided, well, I'll drive around and like see the neighborhood too, and and I just started driving south, and I just was like, I don't I don't know anything <laughs> about any of these places. These are all totally new to me, and and that's when I realized I was like, oh, I'm um, I'm in for some kind of adventure here. When you were up, when you were in school in the Northeast, and you told people where you from Boca, did people just assume you were from Miami? No, because of Seinfeld. People know Boca because of Seinfeld. So they were just like, oh, you're from a place where old people come from, and which is not untrue. So you could just lean into that, Scott. That was yeah, like, I mean, like but, but I was, I will say, I was blatantly Floridian mm -hmm. uh, in Connecticut. Like, everyone knew that I did not come from Boston, New York, like but these places where most of the kids on campus came from. I mean, I dressed different. I looked different. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked like a Florida kid. So when you were in school, when did you, were, were you always, did you initially define yourself as a writer or did, was poetry always your first genre medium that you felt? No, I, I always loved writing and I always wrote poems, but not, I, I mean, I never realized there were living poets really, I think until I got to grad school almost. Um, no, I loved writing, but it really, really film was my first love and that was the thing I thought I would go into and pursue. Um, and did for a little while. That was my, my first jobs out of college where, you know, I worked on films in San Francisco. And, but, but doing that work, I realized that that was when I realized I wanted to be a writer was because on my days off I was writing and there was just something internally that said to me, this is what you should be doing and this other thing is not what you should be doing. 
I mean, I actually have a film background as well in New York, so I definitely relate to that. What role did you have on the film set? Well, I started as a PA, mm -hmm. you know, as pretty much everyone does. And I think the last big role that I had, I was a prop master on mm -hmm. a film. Um, but I didn't really, and I did a little bit of assistant camera work, like when someone would let me, <laughs> basically. But I never got any higher than that. I mean, I only did it for about a year and a half, so... Yeah, no, I appreciate that because, I mean, I started as a production assistant as well, production coordinator. So I think when you're in that kind of, I think every part on a film set, every person contributes mm -hmm. to the vision of the film. But I think you realize if you have, if you're called to tell a story, mm -hmm. you feel very much like there's, there's a division, there's a divide. So as far as defining it, as far as setting the narrative, I feel like if you want there's the, if you want to be part of the creative production of a film, you realize very quickly that you either need to be in that part or you need to find somewhere else, some other outlet. Yeah, I realized that pretty quickly. I mean, I, I can tell you that my contributions to the films I worked on was very <laughs> minimal. Um, and I realized that there was like a divide mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't like something where you worked your way up. You know, and, and then back in the day, like in the 30s, that was the way you became a director was you yeah. worked your way up through the studio system. But that's obviously not how it works now. And yeah, so I realized like if I ever wanted to make a film, you know, me working as a grip was <laughs> not necessarily going to get me there, you know. I mean, I do think it's interesting on sets, especially for PAs. It, there's, a, there's such a cruelty to it because all of these magical things happen and then they stand you in front of them and then tell you to turn around and not look. It's like, you're literally, I remember one time we were making it rain in the West Village, mm -hmm. and my job was to be two blocks down and not let anybody touch craft service. Yep. So I got in trouble one time. I worked on a, um, I was a PA on like a bigger film. It was an Ashley Judd film, mm -hmm. and Morgan Freeman. And the, the, one of the ACs, the assistant camera people, was someone I had worked with before. And so I was a PA, but like there were so many PAs that like some of us just didn't even get jobs because they like weren't organized. So I just wandered off and I was like, hey, do you need help? So because I wanted to be near the camera. So because that's where all the action is. So I hung out with the AC all day. I was like chatting with the director. I was like having a great time. And finally, the, the AD found me and was like, wait, who are you? What do you do? <laughs> and then put me and I had to stand behind a tree for the next four hours. You know, that's so. what they do. It's like and there's always that PA that finds their way to the monitor. Just kind of, you know, that was me. Uh, but you were the PA uh, by the monitor. Always. Was, somebody is just like, and they love catching you. Like they mm -hmm. love being that person that's going to put you in your place. It's it's a it's a really interesting world of like very strict hierarchies and like you have to be in exactly like, you know, you're on this team, you're on this team, and those two teams don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the, the funny thing about that that day on set too, it ended up in like the National Enquirer because. <laughs> There was, uh, it was, the movie was G.I. Jane. Okay. Now that that's coming back to me. And there was a scene where Ashley Judd has to, is driving the car into the military base to like meet with Morgan Freeman or something. And so she's actually driving the car and there's a camera in the passenger seat. So the, the door is open on the passenger side of the car mm -hmm. for, to have room to put the camera in. And there's, you know, it's a very coordinated outdoor take because there's like soldiers marching around, you know. And all these, and there's multiple camera angles, so everything has to look real. And the woman who G.I. Jane is based on, like the actual soldier, they had her in the movie as an extra, like as a funny thing, you know? So she's the one who's like leading the marching soldiers. And Ashley Judd came around the corner and clipped her with the car door <laughs> and knocked her to the ground. And literally within two hours, the news was out. Like somebody went immediately got on the phone and called somebody. Um, so that, that, I think that was the, the most notable part of my film career. Yeah, and that's a classic PA experience because this, yeah. this is happening. It's co being covered by national news outlets, and you're up a tree. I was up a tree. Yeah, as soon as they that's caught me, they I was you. just, I, they were like, what's the worst job we can give you where you'll be farthest from the action and have absolutely nothing to do? And that's where I was. So how soon after coming out of this film experience did you go did you did you start writing poetry more more seriously i, I was only writing fiction and nonfiction at that point i tried to get a job as a journalist while in san francisco and couldn't find one because i had no experience and uh so i ended up getting a job at a small paper in the mountains in colorado because uh, I decided if I wanted to be a writer i needed to be writing so i wanted mm -hmm. to do a job that involved writing because i figured that's how i'll get better 
So I got a job at this really small paper in Eagle County, Colorado, and I did that for about two years and then realized that that also was probably not going to get me anywhere I wanted to go either. And I needed to go back to grad school if I wanted to be a fiction writer, which is what I wanted to be at the time. So I, uh, I, I applied to grad schools and uh, the only one I got into was FIU. So I went to FIU. But I went as a fiction student and it wasn't until taking a poetry class my first semester with Campbell McGrath that I kind of realized that poetry was still a living art form and it wasn't just something that people stopped doing in the 1800s. And, and that as soon as I got into it, I was bewitched and I switched over to poetry. Is there a singular poem that you can identify in that, in that very narrow frame of reference of that experience that semester? Yeah, I you know I don't re- I, no I, I don't remember the name of the poem, but it was a Jack Gilbert poem mm-hmm. um, that Campbell brought into class one day where it felt so the language felt so contemporary and immediate to me in a way that I think I hadn't experienced, um, and I realized oh wow like this this is a real thing and mm-hmm. y- you could write a poem in language that yeah that that speaks to me and my experience you know and and poets are doing that you know and just the whole that whole course i mean it it it's a it's a writing workshop but what the teacher is doing is constantly introducing new poems to you throughout the semester in order to get you to write something and just you know it was basically like a very quick um retrospective or history of 20th century poetry which again i knew nothing about so it was really eye-opening and um, just, I was like, wow, this art form is really alive and incredible. I, I mean, I do think it's interesting that you came, that you even started in film and you ended up specifically in poetry, even more so than if you had taken kind of a detour through screenwriting, which would mm-hmm. be more the kind of more direct path or, or fiction or nonfiction writing, which which makes sense because I do think poetry and film, they share that in the sense that it's a, it's, it's a sketch, it's visual and it evokes. Mm-hmm. And it has its own logic, mm-hmm. but just the way like you have, if you and if you think of a film set, how it's all put together, it is so illogical. Like it, it's it's all meant to suggest, and mm-hmm. it suggests a whole world that isn't really there's there's mm-hmm. such there there's this sense of I don't even know how to describe it. Something like kind of magical and temporary that's very intemporary that you're creating and yet isn't absolutely reality that everyone can disappear into that I think mirrors po- what poetry does in a way that maybe some of these other more yeah and it, no I think it it you know the that sort of logic that leaps you know mm-hmm. and, and is very imagistic is totally shared between the two art forms what's funny about that too is one of the things I hated about film sets was how hurry up and wait it was and mm-hmm. how like anxiety driven the whole experience was where it was like it was calm, and then someone's yelling at you like, "I needed this ten minutes ago," even mm-hmm. though I'm just telling you now. It is that whole hecticness of us. It's like this is not my vibe it's at my all. Vibe. Um, but what's funny, and then and then I went and become a po- I became a poet, you know, because I didn't want that environment. And then I started a festival, which is like kind of a very it's similar a little, collaborative. Yeah. You like, like make <laughs> tiny films just throughout the entire yeah. month of April once a year. I mean, event production and making a film they're they're not dissimilar in yeah. terms of you know the the environment of it. Um, so I don't know. I somehow came back to it by accident. Yeah. I mean, I definitely relate to it because I think Miami Freedom Project for us, when you, uh, any kind of campaign, whether it's on an issue or any kind of GOTV political campaign, you are making a film. It is that mm-hmm. same kind of like production mm-hmm. where the stakes are very temporarily high. The personalities are there and it's that. I don't think it's relatable to a lot of people, but it does fall in line with a lot of different kinds of projects and events that people understand better no totally and and the great thing about it which I I never really got to when I was working on film because I just didn't do it long enough but you know working on O Miami and working on events and things that are very Mm time-based and complicated and you know there is that collaborative spirit of doing this hard thing together Mm -hmm. that is so fun and so rewarding that I know a film can be like that too you know uh, I just I never got there (laughs) so you're you found your path to FIU, Mm -hmm. you're dedicated to becoming a solitary poet, Mm -hmm. and then how did you go from that initial awareness that you wanted to to write in this in in this medium to Oh Miami? Like what was the first version of Oh Miami that we may not even be aware of? 
It was it was called University of Wynwood. It was a fake university that I invented as I was leaving grad school. So I had, you know, I had switched from fiction to poetry in grad school. And in doing that, I realized that I didn't know what it meant to be a poet in the world. You know, fiction writer, I was like, oh, I'll write books. And, you know, I think like there's probably some money you could make there, but also I'll probably end up working at a university teaching or something at the same time. So I, I feel like I understood the path. And with a poet, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I know I don't want to leave Miami. So I have to figure out how to be a poet in Miami. And so I started organizing things just to, to find community because I didn't really know any other way to do it. So I, I created this thing called University of Wynwood, which was a fake university, and it was totally a joke. You know, this is 2008 when Wynwood, there were, there were New York Times articles being written about Wynwood as an arts neighborhood, but there was nothing there except like three galleries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there wasn't even like a Joey's pizza yet or any, there's no Panther coffee, there was none of that. What year was this, I'm sorry? 2008. Okay. So I was like, well, I'll start, you know, Wynwood is going to be this huge thing. I'll start the university now. So when Wynwood blows up, I'll already own it, you know. But it, but it was totally just a joke. And it was just about how Miami hypes everything up before it exists, you know, and pretends that it's this huge thing. But Miami's great at that. It's great at, like, manifesting something that it, it said, you know, in a, in a publicity article 10 years ago. So, um, so I started, the first thing I organized was a lecture series, um, that really didn't have anything to do with literature, but was something that I was like, oh, I can invite people who I think are interesting to just talk about who they are and what they do. Um, and at the same time, me and some friends from grad school were doing this thing where we were writing poems on the street for money with manual typewriters. And we were doing it on second Saturdays in Wynwood, which mm -hmm. was the only time that people were in Wynwood was for when the galleries opened and people walked around. And so I was, and that group ended up being called Miami Poetry Collective, which was named by Campbell <laughs> when we met one time. And so I was doing things as Miami Poetry Collective, and I was doing things as University of Wynwood. And eventually these things kind of merged, because I was the, the person who was organizing both of them. And with the University of Wynwood, I realized that, you know, there were other people doing lecture series, like museums did them. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I don't, I don't know that there's a huge need for that, honestly, but there's very few people who are bringing poets to Miami. Uh, the universities were doing it. UM would do it, but at that time they weren't really advertising it publicly. So unless you were part of that university campus, you probably didn't even hear about it. F and FIU was doing it twice a year. Uh, but again, like, you know, it was a small event. And, and that was it. So I was like, you know what, there, there's a need here for, to bring poets to Miami, so I'll do that. And so I pitched, uh, I pitched Alberto A. Barguin, the president of Knight Foundation, on bringing poets to Miami. And Knight gave me an extremely small amount of money to do it for a couple years. And by having the poets sleep on my couch, I brought, I think, like 14 people in those two years. And yeah, and then at, when that was a success, I went back to them and said, hey, can we do a whole festival? And, and then... That ended up, I, and when we started to do the festival, I realized that I can't call it the University of Wynwood Poetry Festival. <laughs> like, just that name just wasn't a serious name to me. I was like, I can't. I mean, I, I hope that there are still t-shirts in existence because <laughs> we need to put those in the archive. But yeah, it's a little, yeah. It's a little clunky. It just it, it felt like what we the festival should be bigger than that. It should mm -hmm. it shouldn't it shouldn't have a tongue in cheek name. It it should have something that represents it and. So we called it Oh Miami because, you know, we, we designed the festival as this month-long thing where the mission was for every single person in Miami to encounter a poem. And we'd be doing poetry in public places. We'd be doing community events. We'd be doing collaborations. And it felt bigger than Wynwood. And I didn't want to label it with Wynwood, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what we came up with the name Oh Miami, which is O, comma, Miami. Everyone loves to write it as an apostrophe, but it's a comma. And the idea behind that is it's the classic address of the beloved in a poem, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. and Miami's the beloved and, and O is our address of them. So the, the festival is about loving Miami. There's so many things I love about this story because I think when you think about that initial, so in some kind of like publicist dream shop, spitting out an article because of three galleries, when what is a new art destination? I think when you think of like an urban, new art Miami destination, I don't think anybody was, I don't think poetry was on the top of anybody's list. So to take it so literally and say, okay, this is, this is also an art, like 
to just that assumption that this is what people wanted when I don't think it's something that was necessarily articulated, I think is brilliant. Well, you, you, you actually hit on, I think, something I learned doing it. Um, so definitely the, the whole like bombastic nature of it's a month long and everybody's going to encounter a poem mm -hmm. was very much inspired by Miami. And yeah. just that, that attitude of like, this is great. You're going to love it. You know, like with zero evidence of support. I just felt like a very Miami thing. Um, and at the same time, you know, Knight Foundation, who was our, you know, our major funder and still is, they were doing these random acts of culture mm -hmm. at the time, which was kind of like the flash mob thing that happened around that time. And so they were having like opera singers pop up and do things. And so there was a little bit of that spirit in it. But I really thought to me, it was just publicity. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I still was under the assumption that, well, nobody's actually going to care about poetry. You know, I mean, I'm going to pretend like they're caring, but it's not actually going to happen. And then as soon as we started doing the festival, I realized that Miamians really do care about poetry. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, like we're more serious about it than I was at that time, because for so many people in Miami, poetry is very tied up with national identity. Mm -hmm. um, and they memorize poems at a very young age to like learn about who they are and where they come from and who their people are. And so people were like, poetry? Yeah, of course, it's a big deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. poetry is super important. I was like, oh, oh, it is? You actually <laughs> believe that? <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, I agree. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, and I think that's, it's so brilliant because when I think of when would, yes, you don't think of this kind of like, you know, hard driving art scene that's going to very quickly divert into, you know, a kind of promotional, more corporate, corporatized business cycle. If you think of, I can only speak from the Cuban experience. Yeah, it, you know, being raised by my grandmother who was a teacher, there was a part of the afternoon where I would memorize and recite poetry. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of it, uh, to me that was always a kind of private cultural practice mm -hmm. that you never thought it's ever gonna manifest or become ingrained or, or something was gonna be called forth in the city that we always think of as, as being an extension of, of, of Cuba, of the island. So I definitely think you tapped into something. You tapped into all of our... Yeah. Martí, Jose, you know, Rosa Blanca. It's definitely part of our kind of shared language. Totally. And I did it by accident. <laughs> I mean, like... Um, but, but, but I, you know, I very quickly realized how... Just how much it meant to people, you know. And, um, and then I realized very quickly that I was... I was in the best town in the United States to start a poetry festival and just didn't even realize it that like there were all of these people who would immediately care um, because it was personal for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just like an art form, you know, it was, it's part of who I am. Yeah. Well, you realize that, and I think you felt that, but did other people like how, how like making other people understand that that was possible in Miami. Did you face any resistance when you were talking, to, when you were bringing down poets from national poets, international poets? I feel like I've discovered so many wonderful writers because of Oh Miami. And I think it's exciting to think that they are here and that they come here and that they're, they're part of our kind of yearly, this yearly festival that's so identified with Miami. When you would tell people to come down to Miami, given some images people have of Miami if they don't, if they're not up from here, they don't really know. What was, what was some kind of, what, did you get any pushback ever? No, never. I, I think poets were always excited to come here mm -hmm. because for most of them, it was a place they'd never been and never been invited to before. Um, and poets, I think, you know, really good poets are naturally curious people. You know, mm -hmm. they're open-minded. I mean, that's why they're good poets. So they, they, they were always like super curious and then would come down here and love it and want to come back and just were fascinated by the city because it isn't like, you know, other cities they were going to in the U S. So, um, yeah, no, I, I always loved it. I mean, I mean, when you first started the question, I was thinking about it in terms of getting people to come to poetry readings mm -hmm. in Miami, which again, yeah, I mean, there's a difference between having a love for poetry and wanting to go to a poetry reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's, there's definitely a leap that not everybody takes there. And so, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do early on was combine, do events that combine poetry with other art forms or other things so mm -hmm. that it gave people an in, you know, to come and it would make poetry feel less of a risk as something mm -hmm. you're going to devote your evening to, 
you know? So if it's like a film that has poetry in it, well, I like film, so I'll go to that, you know? Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that and, and we continue to do a lot of that because we want poetry to be a safe space, be, you know, an art form that if you come and take a chance on coming to one of the events, you walk away feeling like, oh, I would do that again. Yeah. How soon in the process did you diversify to where you ha you were crowdsourcing? So people in Miami were invited to offer an event that would align with what you were trying to accomplish in Miami. When did you, when did you bring other people into it? From the first festival. Wow. Um, yeah, we did, we did a call. Yeah. The, for the, you know, so it was 2010 was the first time we did it. Cause the first festival was April 2011. And yeah, we asked people for their ideas and asked them to, um, yeah, contribute to the festival and looked for partners. And, and we also, we went around knocking on everybody's door in 2010. I mean, just any arts organization, like, can you do something in mm -hmm. April on your calendar that intersects with this? And we'll put it on our schedule. And everybody was super friendly and welcoming and, and said yes. And so it, it was, a, it was definitely a different process because we put everything we could on the schedule, whether we had anything to do with it or not. If it like touched poetry, we put it on the schedule. And then over the years, we realized that we wanted to, everything that was like the festival, we wanted to have control over it so that it was the kind of experience that we wanted it to be, um, which is hard to do when you're just putting things on a calendar. So it changed in that the the call for projects got more and more curated and more and more uh, targeted, I think, in terms of what we were looking for. Um, but, but the process is really the same. Like every like late summer, early fall, we ask for people, Hey, do you want to contribute mm -hmm. an idea? And then we try and collaborate with those people to make them happen. And, and all of them don't end up happening. Um, but you know, but we try to do as many as we can. I mean, what's so impressive to me with Oh Miami is also the commitment. And I think the way the city, the county, lends itself. I think one of the pieces that I loved is when you were flying into Miami International Airport, writing a poem on the roofs. Mm -hmm. When I, I think we, we can kind of, we can think of doing anything, making, doing anything in the city can be so onerous and the bureaucracy. And yet for Oh Miami, it just lends itself. These, these kinds of obstacles. I think there was, a, wasn't there like a poetry works department yeah. that you established? <laughs> Was that legitimate in any way? How did no, you think of No, no. Our, our philosophy early on was ask for forgiveness, not permission, <laughs> um, which we stole from Paris Hilton. I think mm -hmm. she was the first person I heard say that. It's very wise, Paris Hilton. But so we, yeah, I mean, to speak to those two projects specifically, um, the, the one on the rooftops, an artist named Randy Berman uh, had the idea and wanted to paint poems on rooftops. Mm -hmm. And we had just started really doing educational programs in the schools. And so we had these great kids' poems. And we were like, what if the poem on the rooftop was written by mm -hmm. like an elementary school student? So it was like a kid from that neighborhood, like talking to people as they're flying in and out of Miami. Wouldn't that be amazing? And Randy loved it. And it took us two years to get that together. But, uh, but we finally were able to do it. And we were able to do it, you know, again, through collaboration. Mm -hmm. There were two of them. There was one uh, on top of Mana. You know, and they gave us the permission to do, to paint on their building. The other one was at FIU. Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up collaborating with the FIU Honors College, which was the only way we could get it done on top of their parking garage. So, you know, it, it's always through collaboration. Um, but since they own the buildings, it was no big deal. The one that you're referring to uh, was the Department of Poetry Works, which we just made up fake, like, like Miami Dade Public Works t-shirts, but it said, you know, Poetry Works instead of Public Works. And we had yellow hard hats. And uh, and we went around installing illegal street signs around Miami that they, we use the same manufacturer that the county does. And so they look like real street signs, but they just had short poems on them, which were also crowdsourced and written by Miamians. Uh, coincidentally, that project was also one of Randy's ideas. <laughs> right. uh, for a couple years there, <laughs> Randy would submit like 50 ideas and because he has a lot of great ideas we we would try and do a lot of them but but yeah so we, we put up the signs and uh they're pretty much all gone now but there's one at books mm -hmm. and books that mm -hmm. mitch kaplan protected which is if you walk into books and books and you the bar is in front of you in the courtyard if you go to the left the sign is next to the door there so that's the yes. last one in miami in the wild yeah i mean i would love to see what 
uh, which of Randy's ideas somebody looked at and said, no, too far. Like, I can't imagine oh, man. what he was like. There, there were so many good ones. I mean, yeah. You know, it was really, I mean, we tried to do a lot of times, like the most ambitious ones were the ones we were interested in. I mean, you know, and that's why the rooftop thing took so long is because we were like, we have to do this. We have mm -hmm. no idea how we're going to do it, but we have to figure it out, you know, and, and Melody and I just worked on it until, until we found a solution, you know? Um, but that's, you know, that, that's always the fun of it is like, what can we get away with? What can we do? And now that we're more of an institution, we, we can't really work like that anymore, yeah. you know? So, but, but it, but it's always through collaboration, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think that that has allowed us and continues to allow us to do things that other people might find difficult or impossible. Yeah. And I, I do think, you know, we talk about encountering a poem, but to me, what's also so beautiful about the festival is that everyone becomes a poet. It's, it's so, every, you just immediately engage. When you talk about some of the students, their work is, it, it's, it's stunning. I think we, you know, we're so proud of bringing people in. And I think in Miami, as a growing city, we're always thinking about who can validate us, who can come here and see some value and lend themselves to it. And that, that, is, that is a wonderful experience and that's so much a part of Oh Miami that we have so many wonderful poets who are part of this experience that we get to engage with in these really wonderful, intimate settings. But I think suddenly everyone around you feels like a poet. And I think what you've done in the schools is incredible. So when did, at what point did you start doing work in the schools? It was 20... It was either 2014 or 15 that the, there was a poet who was an FIU grad uh, named Laurel Nakanishi, who before she came to Miami had, had worked in a Poets in Schools program in, in Montana. Mm -hmm. So she had this experience of doing this, and she proposed it as a festival project that she wanted to go to one elementary school and do this four-session class with the kids that would end with a pizza party and the kids would read their work. So we did that at Orchard Villa Elementary School, um, and it was so incredible that we asked her to do it again in the fall and expand it to eight weeks instead of four. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And, and then the principal of that school told a friend of hers who was a principal at another school, you know, that like you should bring this program to your school. And then all of a sudden it was a program and we were doing it. And, you know, one school would grow to two, grow to three, and it just kept going. But also through that process, we realized that also changed how we thought about the festival mm -hmm. because early on, you know, in 2011, 2013, the poems that were in the like Poetry in Public Places projects were not necessarily by Miamians. They were like canonical poems that, mm -hmm. that we had just decided would go there. And through doing the education program, we realized that it's way more meaningful if these poems we're putting into public space are written not only by Miamians, but come from the same neighborhoods where the project takes place so that it's neighbors talking to neighbors and they're getting to redefine where they live and what Miami is and what place means to them and all those things. And that whole process, we, we named it civic publishing mm -hmm. because we felt like it was a whole process and an ecosystem that we were creating. And that's now, that that's the heart of the organization is we spend the whole year in doing education or like our Zippodes mm -hmm. project where we're asking people to write poems about Miami and send them to us. And then we do these projects that then push the poems back into the communities that they came from. So people can read them and the whole point of that is you know the, the the people who get to define what Miami is is a very small group of people right mm -hmm. it, it's politicians it's developers it's you know it's a small group of power but through this process what we hope to do is let people speak for their neighborhoods and for where they live in a way that they wouldn't get to otherwise it really is incredible and I feel like every festival I almost wait for it to happen and there's no reason why it has to happen but it does, and what the feeling I get is that you go to these events that are so specific to the workshop, the poet you're hearing, the place, the location, they're all so different, and then there's almost this point where you get to the end and everybody comes together. So, and you don't, they're not people that you would expect to just feel like they can belong in the same place, but it's unmistakable, and I think last year for me it was at Zippo's, I know that there was an earlier dinner where I felt that, and it's almost like Miami becomes a Richard Scarry book, where all of a sudden you're seeing all the people together, and it's in such, uh, there's a point where everything is in such perfect balance. Um, and that's very much 
Zippo's, I think, is, is, is a part of that. But I never know where that, where that feeling for me is going to emerge. But at some point in April, that's what happens. And it happens for us, too. I mean, I think the joy of doing the festival has been that we've had these really unique experiences and met people that we never would have met otherwise and heard their stories that we never would have heard, you mm -hmm. know. And it just makes you appreciate how just what incredible people there are just like right next door to you, mm -hmm. you know, but because you have no way to hear, you know, what their emotional life is like, you just don't know. Um, and yeah, and when the festival's at its best, that's what happens is mm -hmm. that people get those, those interactions. And, and, and Zippo's is probably the most reliable event for that because, it, you know, we never know who's the, the judge is, is named Sarah Trudgeon. We never know who, who Sarah's gonna pick for these mm -hmm. Zippo's for the spotlight poems and they come from all over South Florida and they're just there. There's just all their stories are different. And every year you just hear them and you're like, wow, like just if, if someone hadn't asked or given the invite, like, you know, you never would have mm -hmm. known, you know? Yeah. And I do think there's times where even I go to like a workshop and I think I'm, I'm not going to write a poem. Like I, I, I think like I'll listen, there'll be something interesting and there's something about, the way it's it's programmed that at the end you're like I, I did it like it was <laughs> and it's not it's not good or bad you don't judge sure. it but something that it's just this very small feeling of for this moment I was able to do something I would have never thought myself capable of and I think that's the power of poetry if you you let it be the power of poetry and what I mean by that is you know the the barrier for participation of poetry is pretty low mm -hmm. um, like you know if you can think you can write a poem I mean even if you don't express it out loud or write it down so anyone can do it mm -hmm. but I think you have to you know what I feel really strongly about is poetry should always be about participation and it should be about ex expression and there should never be any limits on that or any sort of guardrails or me telling you well this is a poem and this is not a poem mm -hmm. it's you're the poet you get to decide that and when the the environment can be like that and you just make it safe and open for people that's what makes people feel like they can open up and actually write something down and then as soon as that cracks open in you uh, you know i've just seen so many people like see the possibility of that and and it, you know it's a journey of self-discovery you never know what you're going to write until you write yeah you, and you just it, it's so incredible because you've also built something with each festival which you think of as very ephemeral and it happens while it happens then. You built the school programs in the schools, and I think a generation of poets, that's... Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing, and I think, you know, it, it's hard to imagine. I don't think we, we always do a good job of giving people a path to mm -hmm. creativity in any field, in mm -hmm. any medium, and I think that's something that I think so many students in Miami data have benefited from because of O Miami. But there's also a publishing arm. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me how that came about and what, how you see that continuing? Yeah, I mean, I always wanted to make books. I mean, even like, forever. Uh, I just, I just love books, you know, and I just think they're fascinating. So, um, I always knew it was something I wanted to do, and in, I think I we I had kicked around some ideas for a press early on, but they never went anywhere. And then um, the first book project we did was um, uh, the first one we worked on was two poets. Uh, Frank Baez, who's from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. and Dave Landsberger, who is a Chicago poet but was living in Miami at the time and was writing about Miami. And so the idea was to publish both uh, a collection by each of them at the same time, and each book would read one way in English and the other way in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so Frank, Frank was writing in Spanish, so we translated it in English, and Dave was writing in English, and so we translated it in Spanish. And the, I thought that was going to be the whole press, was that it was always bilingual. Mm -hmm. And it was bilingual in a way that wasn't privileging one language over another, in the same way that Miami doesn't really privilege English over Spanish or Spanish over English. Like, they both kind of coexist, you mm -hmm. know, and you would never... You know, if anything, Spanish is dominant, but, um, you know, there's... I think there's less of... You know, when you read a translated book, it's very clear, like, what the hierarchy is among the languages. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try and eliminate that hierarchy and just have them coexist. But once we did that, um, I kind of realized that, you know, that the organization is Oh Miami. It, it should be, a, the books should be about Miami. It mm -hmm. should be a regional press. Uh, and around the same time, um, 
uh, these two artists, Tiffany and George, came to us with this book called Forager, which mm -hmm. is all about foraging for uh, edible fruit in Miami. Um, and so we, when we worked on that book, it was like it was a totally different experience. But we were like, you know what? These, these books need to be a, about Miami in some important way because like that's that's who we are and that's what we do and so then it's you know it's it's always been something we've done on the side because we've, we've never had like a uh, a department for it or mm -hmm. like a, a really really big grant to do it we've gotten grants to do specific books but not for the whole program and so it's something we all love but we're always like stealing time <laughs> to mm -hmm. be able to figure out how to do it um, and so that's one of the things I'm hoping we can grow and in the future. I mean, I should admit now that when I was, because I, I grew up in Miami, lived in New York for many years. When I was coming back, just before I came back, I found Forger in a little shop in Brooklyn. That was, it was one of those very like little shop, but like very highly curated little shop in Brooklyn and every, every, where everything's an object. And I discovered Forger there. And I remember that sense of, of this is what's happening in Miami now, wanting mm -hmm. to, feeling like it was a place I wanted to be because it was just, it was so, it was very simple, but it was so evocative and there was such an immediate connection to the environment around Miami that wasn't what you would think of in any kind of typical mm -hmm. way that made me, and I think that's where I started connecting with Oh Miami almost as soon as we got back. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think what we always want to do with the books is... Um, document Miami, but also document it in a way that's trying to elevate it to the highest level we can. Just just to show people that, you know, Miamians and Miami culture is worthy of like the highest level treatment, you know, mm -hmm. and the highest amount of respect. And there are people here who are as talented as people anywhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and they deserve that sort of platform, you know. So that's that's what we try to do with every book. And so that I mean that's amazing that that you had that experience. Um, so yeah, I mean that's th this place is great, and so we want the books to be great that yeah. are about it, you know. And I have to say the latest release, which I have here, Ventanitas, I'll show it too. If you haven't looked at this book, you, you every I think everybody in Miami needs to have this book. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but I think very early on when we when I first met you, you talked about wanting to basically have a map of every ventanita. And I was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's great. It's not happening. Okay. Or like, it'll never be complete. And it felt like I, I could see I could always see you guys taking on any project and like seeing it through. But I just couldn't imagine that you'd be tracked. And I do think this book is just such it's a beautiful completion of a vision that I think was so changeable, but you adjusted to it and you produced something really amazing for all of us in Miami because yes, it shows what is beautiful about Ventanita culture and it's a window into Miami's coffee culture, but it also captures a moment that you realize is potentially not leaving, but evolving yeah. and changing in a way that we all, we're seeing, I, I, I see books, I see Ventanitas in here that are no longer open, yep. which is shocking because yep. I think we always think of them as eternal. Mm -hmm. um, and I discover new ones that I can't mm -hmm. wait to, you know, that I thought I knew them all, but no, there's new ones here that I haven't experienced yet. So can you talk about the, the evolution of this yeah. book? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Ventanita culture, you know, as we know, we talked about, you and I even, uh, we know it's super unique to Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carlos Frias' reporting on that has like really proven how unique it is to Miami. Uh, and how it is this confluence of all these things that happen in this specific place. Um, and it's just such a Miami phenomenon that there's this like infrastructure that, mm -hmm. you know, is a combination of like having air conditioning and don't want to be wasting the air conditioning, but also there's people who want coffee at every time of the day mm -hmm. and they want to be able to get it quickly and easily and then, and also stand around and, and BS with people while they do it. And, so it's just it's this amazing confluence that Carlos has done such a good job of 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 writing about like the origins and how it's developed, but it, it like just like Miami, it is always changing. I mean, there were other ventanitas that that were supposed to be in the book that closed mm -hmm. soon enough for us to take them out, you know, and we debated like, do we keep them in or not? Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, because Miami changes so fast, and we were working on this during the pandemic, and you know, that was such a big upheaval for a lot of businesses, but. But so, I mean, back to the point is, you know, this is a story we'd wanted to tell for many years, but um, 
Daniela, Daniela Perez Maron, mm -hmm. who's the principal author of the book, she's, uh, um, grew, you know, born and raised here in Miami and, you know, went to Ventanitas all her life. It's like very natural to her. And then she went to London for graduate school as a graphic designer and, uh, like read something on, in, in a Miami Herald, you know, alert that came to her mm -hmm. phone. Uh, about how there were some new laws about Ventanitos and COVID, like, you know, mm -hmm. and she told some of her classmates about it and none of them knew what a Ventanito was. <laughs> They're all just like, what are you talking about? There's a window, mm -hmm. a coffee comes out, like, what is that? And she, that was her moment of realizing how special it was and how unique to her home it was and it made her homesick. And so she ended up doing a Ventanitos book as her graduate thesis project. And after she did that, um, someone said to her, I think one of her professors was like, you should maybe like try and get this published. Like it's really good. And so she, she knew about us. And so she, she pitched it to us by email. Um, and we were like, you know, yes, <laughs> let's try and do that. And then that was, you know, and then eventually Jesse came in to do the photos cause Daniela takes photos, but she's in London most of the time. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, we wanted to bring in a collaborator to, to bring in the visual side of it. And then the last piece of it, um, which the O Miami staff really insisted on was, um, putting poems about coffee by Miamians in the book. And so there's 20 poems in the book, uh, that are just all about coffee culture in one way or another. And, uh, it, to me, it kind of ties it all together, you know? I mean, everything, I mean, and it is, there's a window in the book, which to me, I just want to scream. And then there's the kind of perforated, there's just nothing that you all don't think about. And I think Jesse Schilling's work is incredible. And each picture is, it's, it's so interesting because you realize there is an experience that's the same at every Ventanita, but then it draws such a diversity of people. Yeah, I mean, just like a Ventanita. I mean, and, and if you took the pictures on a different day, some of the people would be the same because they have regulars who were mm -hmm. there every single day, but then, you know, everyone else would be different and the, the feeling of it might be different and the light might be different. So, you know, it really is like a river, like you step your toe into and it's going to be different every single time. Um, but, you know, and that's, that's another reason why, like, I think documenting Miami is so important because it does change. And, like, this book will probably feel vastly out of date in like five years you know like unfortunately I mean, that's I probably true not. i hope not but there's it's, it's definitely a possibility how strict were you about the ventanita because was brazo fuerte included did i miss it or was Off brazo the top of my head i don't remember okay i don't think so though because i feel like there's a ventanita but then there's not because it's just inside so i was curious i was like was there like a yeah. criteria that it had to be we there was not a criteria, but we definitely had those discussions about what deserves to be included. Because in, in Daniela's uh, thesis, she included the Starbucks on Miracle Mile that's no longer there. But mm -hmm. when it opened, it had a Ventanita. And her point in including it was like, look, even Starbucks, when they come to Miami, knows that you got to put the Ventanita up. You know, and then we were talking about it and we were like, does Starbucks deserve a place in this book? <laughs> I kind of, you know, I, I, I when I, I, I read that entry and I thought it was also really interesting because I think there was a point where Starbucks tried to open in the same mall as a Pinecrest Bakery mm -hmm. and they tried to tell them that there was a non-compete and the mm -hmm. Pinecrest Bakery took the very position of like, but that's not coffee. Like there was yeah. a very much an honest like, oh, no, no, no we make this coffee yeah I, there's no competition here right yeah we don't make frappuccinos so for starbucks to have basically like you know been taken down by this just this miami one mm -hmm. and had to like do a ventanita i think that's brilliant yeah and so you know i we were like well if it if it helps tell the story of how ubiquitous this is you know we'll include it we ended up just like talking about it in the forward but you know, we did include some ventanitas in there that, like, I think are pushing the definition of ventanita, like the Boya de Ventanita, which they mm -hmm. created for the pandemic. Um, you know, that's not really a traditional Cuban coffee place at all. It's an Italian restaurant. Uh, there's the Pack Supermarket in Little mm -hmm. Haiti, which mostly sells fried chicken out of their yeah. uh, window. That was, uh, but yeah, it is a ventanita. I yeah, I mean, so this, you know, there, we wanted to to show how ubiquitous the infrastructure is and how people push it in different directions while also focusing on, you know, the ones that people are going to really think of when they think of like a traditional, you know, Cuban coffee ventanita in Miami. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody has to get this book. Um, uh, thank you. I'm already thinking about how many people who aren't here have to 
I have to give it to just because it it every, it does this feels like home and I think every uh -huh. picture feels that way. Um, we're wrapping up soon, so yeah. I wanted to ask you. We have these questions that we post to everyone. I love it in Miami, um, and I can't wait to hear what you say because I think you're the <laughs> okay. So, first question: What is Miami doing right? What Miami is doing right is, I think, I think Miami is embracing arts and culture as a central part of its identity mm -hmm. in ways that I think are really admirable. Um, you know, when I talk to other executive directors of literary organizations around the country, they're always shocked the amount of support we get from municipalities and from the county itself. Um, so I think the, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a common interest of like wanting arts and culture to be a, a major part of the city. And I think, I think we do pretty well at that. Yeah. Agreed. Um, what is Miami doing wrong? Oh, <laughs> how much time we have? Just pick one. <laughs> yeah. Just pick one. Keep it. Keep it yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, the, 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 the thing that comes to mind is just how there's just absolutely no emphasis on public transit and, mm -hmm. and trying to unite people through public transit because that exacerbates the, the housing problem that we have because, mm -hmm. you know, it, if, if people are connected by rail or light rail or buses that run on time and people understand the schedule, you know, it's okay for people to live out on the margins of the county or even maybe in Broward or something because they can still get to work, they can, they can join in the culture downtown, they can go out to restaurants because the system would take them there. But because there's no system and it doesn't work and it's constantly getting voted down when people are proposing mm -hmm. it, then that makes the, you know, the cost of housing go up. And so that's the main one. Like if we could connect everybody, it would be a different place. I mean, I think you definitely do it through the Oh Miami Festival, but yes. And I think urban planning and transit, when we put these questions in social media, that comes up very specifically. So I think it's it's very present for, for all of us. Number three, what is your most nostalgic Miami memory? Oh, wow, there's so many. I mean, the one that comes to mind, and maybe it's because we were talking about Zippo's earlier, is at one of the Zippo's readings that we did at Vizcaya a few years ago, um, there was a high school student who had won the competition, and, or not, it's not a contest, but she was one of the, the, the Zippo's that was selected, and she came and read her poem, and WLRN always asks the person beforehand, how, you know, how did this poem come about? And her story about how it came about was her family had just moved to Miami within the last year mm -hmm. and the move had been really hard on her and she was really having trouble like adjusting to this place. And when her Zippo was selected, it was like the first time she felt like she was at home here. And I mean, it's hard for me to say it now. I literally was like about to jump in the bay cause I was like crying, <laughs> you know? And I was like, like it literally just for that moment, the whole, the whole festival was worth it. Like just mm -hmm. to do that, you know, just to make like, one person feel like this was a place they could feel at home. Like, yeah. oh, I'll always remember that. Yeah, no, and it's 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 so deserved because I think it the festival is that for so many people in ways that maybe they don't express in that moment. But I've certainly felt that way. Um, what do you miss that Miami used to have? You know, uh, I miss because especially I, maybe I'm thinking of this because we were talking about Winwood earlier, but. I, I miss when Wynwood was like a real neighborhood mm -hmm. for locals, you know, yeah. it was like, and when you went out there, you went there, you just ran into people you knew. And there was at some point, cause I have kids, like I stopped going out, you know, <laughs> and stopped driving around except to like wherever I have to take them. And I remember I hadn't been in Wynwood in a while and I came back and it was like, I was like, what happened here? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I realized it's great. It's like, it's an economic engine and people from all over the world love and come to see it. But it was really fun when, Lester's was there and I could go there and see everybody I knew. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was amazed when I realized Enriquetas was one block over because my sense of disorientation with where we are in the buildings that come up. Yeah. You lose your sense of, of where you are. And props to them for holding out and not selling, you know, and the, and the yeah. people just eventually built a building around them, you know. I just, yeah, I love that Enriquetas is still there. Yeah. This is bittersweet. Um, usually it's a, it's a hypothetical, but when, when you leave Miami... Um, what will you miss the most? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to miss the people. I mean, I just, you know, I, I love how just so talented and brilliant like so many Miamians are. And, 
you know, that I think the arts and culture scene here is like super tight knit and supportive. And uh, I've always felt so supported by people, you know, being creative here. You know, there was never like any like clicky infighting or like, oh, you can't do that because mm-hmm. somebody already does that. You know, it was always if you came and had something to contribute, people were excited to, you know, for you to bring it and, and they welcomed it. And just that Miami's still like that. And I love that about this place. And yeah. And so I am moving to, to <laughs> Illinois and uh, I'm, I'm going to miss that. Yeah. What do you want Miami to look like in 20 years? Yeah, I mean, I want it to be connected by <laughs> by, by public transit. Um, I want it to still be a place where um, people are arriving here from other countries and finding a home here and making a life here. Um, I want it to be, yeah, a place where uh, people, yeah, can afford to live and 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 realize their dreams here, you know, because it has been that for a long time, and I do worry about that going forward. Um, final question. It's very serious. On April 24th, 2016, the Blue Flames were narrowly defeated as a result of dubious judging, despite their magnificent athletic abilities, which gave them a history-making lead going into the slip and slide competition at the inaugural Day of Thrones field day competition. My question is, were the Blue Flames robbed? I know who wrote this question. <laughs> Hi, Carmen. Um, yes, yeah, so we did we did a an event in 2016 called Day of Thrones, which was like a, an old school field day, like that you would have at your school, and teams competed in different competitions, some of which were athletic, some of which were math based or like art based. And uh, there was a team, the Blue Flames, who was crushing everyone, going into the slip and slide competition. Uh, and were overtaken by one point by the green team. I forget the name of their team. I was the sole judge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I contend to this day it was it was it was a fairly judged uh, event. Okay. Uh, you play it that way, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand that there are participants who will will never believe that. So uh, mm-hmm. I get that. And the Blue Flames did win the next year when we had the competition again. New judging process, we did. but they, they did win, so I'm not sure that helps my case, but... Um. Yeah, yeah. Fair is fair. There was, there was redemption in this story, so I, I acknowledge that. Um, you know, thank you so much for this, Scott. I know that, you know, we've talked about Oh Miami, um, and that's, that's, you're, you, you've given us something very wonderful that we're going to keep with us um, if, whether, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a little bit further away than... Um, you know, we would like, and you'll definitely be missed, so you'll, your presence will always be felt. Thank you. I mean, I love this place. Um, spiritually, I'll always be here on some level. Um, I would love to end with you reading one of your poems, because, you know, you if, if you're not the director of the festival, you will still leave us a poet. So I would love to leave, leave you know, you to leave us with your words. So I'll, I'll read a short poem um, that uh, is called Poems About Concentration for People Who Can't Concentrate. Imagine a deer in headlights. Loop that image. Now imagine watching the loop. You're at your desk. You can't concentrate. Imagine if not concentrating was concentrating. That time you took drugs and thought a piece of tinfoil stapled to the wall was a fish tank. But why was there a piece of tinfoil stapled to the wall? Two people, naked, in a gondola suspended over Mont Blanc, Lightning strikes the tower, shorting the wires. Wind and snow shake the gondola. The two people are you and your infant daughter. You're trying to think about your child, but you keep thinking about yourself. Imagine you're the child. Imagine you're a gondola in a blizzard. Imagine the blizzard is inside the gondola. Let go of the wire. All right, well, we're not going to let you go, Scott. So (laughs) definitely... Come back. Um, if you haven't gone, go to Oh Miami. I was going to ask you if there's any specific events, but I can't pick one, so I felt I couldn't ask you to pick one. But are, are there any directions you want to give people so that they take yeah, advantage of this? this definitely. Uh, our big opening event is on April 5th at the North Beach Band Show. Um, it's called In Miami, I'm Happier. It's going to be a ton of locals performing and reading, and the Carroll City Chiefs Marching Band is going to be there. It should be really fun. There's a dinner for this book mm-hmm. called Ventanitas uh, midway through the month. 
that's on our schedule that's going to be really amazing. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of the month, the Zippodes reading mm -hmm. will be the last week. And our kids event, family event called Poetry in Pajamas uh, is coming back on the 26th. So th I think those are some good highlights. All right. Well, wonderful. Everybody should check this out. I've never regretted rallying. If it's like five o'clock on a Wednesday, and you think no traffic, just go. I've never felt like, you know, just tote bags. Scrap. There's always there's something for everyone. Just go, you won't regret it, and you'll feel good that you're a part of this wonderful festival that you're, it's just, you've given us so much of your heart and soul into. So thank, thank you, you, Scott, for no, everything. Thank you, thank you. All right, are we good? <laughs>